ನಮೋತ್ಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ನಮೋತ್ಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುತಸ ನಮೋತ್ಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುತಸ ಅಪಾರುಥ ದೇಶಮತಸ ತವರ So this afternoon we have a, this is a reflection, not a doctrinal meeting to convert you or to force you to believe, but to open you up to reflection. So reflection is being a witness to the way it is. And so we always, the way it is, it's always now, it's always here and now. And when you reflect on that, you know, we, we think of terms of, of age, of time, as we identify with time-bound conditions. And here and now, We create images, we have memories, we have thoughts, we have emotions that come and go in the here and now. And we identify with the emotions we, we experience or the memories or the thoughts, the ideas that arise in the here and now. So that's what suffering is about, is this false identity that we create out of ignorance. So ignorance then, vicha in Pali word, vicha, bhajaya sankhara is the conditions, the sankharas or the changing time-bound conditions. So ask yourself, are you going to operate from a vicha or from vicha or wisdom? So the wisdom is here and now. It's not something you're going to get in the future or you might have had in the past because those are memories or concepts, perceptions about the future, possibilities of being wise, Or maybe you believe you're not wise because you say you have a lot of avicca, you have emotions, you get caught up in your emotions and your memories and hatred and anger, fear and jealousy and greed. And these are all, what are they? They are conditions sankharas, avicca bhajaya sankhara, so ignorance creates these sankharas that we cling to and identify with. And that's why the world is the way it is. That's why we experience suffering and we, we tend to think that uh, we'd like to live in a realm where we don't suffer. So we, we try to find the perfect partner, the perfect mate, the perfect situation. <clears throat> And this, of course, is we can spend a lifetime trying to find happiness or be permanently happy. But if we 
take our stand with the here and now at this moment, it's like this. It puts you into the reflective, open position immediately. Because you can't describe the here and now, really. It, it isn't like it's beautiful or ugly or right or wrong. It's not good or bad. So then we try to look for something here and now that's good or bad. <clears throat> then we're caught up in the future or in ambitions for the future, hopes for the future, regrets for the past. And already, you know, if you trust in awareness, then you realize the perfection, deathless reality, Dhamma is here and now. You don't have to look for it. You are that. That is your pure nature already. But as individual people, we look for our happiness in the future, contentment, freedom from fear, freedom from jealousy, freedom from greed, through sankharas, you know, through ordaining as samanas, or living in monasteries, or going to beautiful tropical islands or finding, trying to look for the perfect mate in your life, the one you can live with for and forever, with forever and be happy. But happiness is very, in that sense of worldly happiness, is impermanent. It's a time-bound condition arising and ceasing. And conditions are always changing. That's their nature. Condition phenomena is unstable, untrustworthy. And that's where we, we'd hope to find our permanent happiness. But inevitably, you know, life, the conditions change. Death of, of loved ones is an experience of, we feel grief, a loss of loved ones who we depend on, uh, who we want to cling to and hold to, keep them alive, because we feel insecure when death is, is uh, something that we, we, we don't understand, we don't know what happens when we die or when some loved one passes away. <clears throat> and then if, you know, close relatives, friends, partners, and that, that, that pass away, then where are we? You know, we, we, our identity is oftentimes so connected with somebody else. Our sense of safety and security dependent upon somebody else who's supportive. So the world is like this. The nature of the world is it's about sankharas, about past, about future, about time and space. Earth, fire, water, and air. Like approaching the emotion of fear, you know, as a experience, when you really reflect on being a human being, male or female, you know, when a baby is born, it's totally helpless. It can't talk, it can't, you know, it can't walk, it depends on somebody else, a mother or some nurse, to, to nurture it. So beginning of life as an infant human being, we, we're, we're totally helpless and dependent 
for survival on somebody else. <clears throat> and then we grow up, we, we get our identity from the mother, the father, the, the religion, the culture, all these things, we form a sense of, of being a separate person, independent person. So when we grow up, we don't need our mother anymore to nurture us. And our father for stability, but we think we're independent. I can look after myself. But then the very beginning of life was totally dependent. When you get old, oftentimes you're totally dependent on somebody else to take care of you. So that's the nature of time. It, it's, it begins and ends. But what, what is it that doesn't begin and end is here and now. Wherever you go, no matter age you might be, no matter what condition, whether you're in healthy or unhealthy, if you're in England or Thailand, it's always here and now. And experience is always here and now. The other day we celebrated 40 years of the Siladaras. Had a beginning and lasted 40 years. But now that's a memory that celebration, very nice day. <clears throat> and so that memories bring up emotions, you know, so we can be aware of that. We can think of the 40-year celebration of the Siladaras, and then we might have emotions arise just by remembering that day, what happened that day. But what is aware of these emotions, aware of memory of yesterday? And that's always here and now. Santitiko dhamma akaliko dhamma ehi pasiko dhamma opanayiko dhamma bhajitang vetida pauvinyuhi we be realized by the why the wisdom fact is be is is not something you don't have or you lack but if your soul identity is always with sankaras how can you possibly get out of that trap It's a, you know, it's a, like a prison, a bondage, because you're bound to what is unsatisfactory, by very nature, what is unsatisfactory. Whether you, you know, it's conditions you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, objects of your senses, or your body, or your senses themselves. <clears throat> you know, they're very delicate, like being able to see I consciousness is, you know, we depend a lot on being able to see things clearly. And yet eyes are very delicate organs and can be easily damaged. So then we, we fear blindness because if we're blind, then what we depend on for stability and identity is what we see. But even in blindness, there's still experience here and now, there's still awareness. Just because you're blind doesn't mean you're not conscious or you're not aware. Then in the world, 
there's a lot of injustice, the dark side of experience, what we don't want, what we're frightened of. And so we, we like to live in a world of, you know, where everything is pretty and bright and happy and, and then the dark shadow comes into our lives, death of some loved one or being abused in some way, or being misunderstood, or being rejected by others. Our house burning down, our loss of our fortune, the loss of our pet cat or dog, the dark side manifests as experience. And we cling to that, we cling to the to, we want to, uh, we get caught in depression, in chronic depression. Because what happened is we didn't want it, it's bad, it shouldn't be like that. But the dark side is Sankara, complete, same as the, the bright side. So, light and dark, if we depend on those experiences, we'll be on, on lightness, on happiness, on youth, on vigor, on good health. Then there's a lot of dread about losing our health, or, or getting old, or dying. So we have to go, you know, there's all kinds of drugs now available for dealing with depression or fears, <clears throat> psychotherapies. You know, it's very much in order now to, to not just try to grin and bear it, but to try to understand why am I so unhappy? Why am I discontented? Why am I so basically anxious and worried? But look at all that, that kind of identity. I'm worried, I'm anxious, I'm frightened. You can reflect on that in the here and now. You begin to observe the fact that I feel worried about tomorrow. I'm frightened of death. It's like this. Well, why does things, why can't the world just be, why can't people be just and fair and understanding and compassionate? Why are people selfish and mean and nasty? Why are governments corrupt? And so we, we want to know why, you know, the world isn't the perfect place that we would like it to be, or why oneself is not as good as one would like to be. So he say, whose fault is it? Am I just, you know, some kind of weird manifestation? Uh, uh, born to be evil, born to be wicked, is that, you know, there's, movies made about that, about being born to be satanic or, and they're, they're very exciting movies usually. The devil is much more exciting than the angel. So blockbuster films are about killing sex because those are exciting. We have sexual feelings, it's, it's uh, energy through our bodies. And then we have ideals of celibacy or purity or monogamy and fidelity as kind of sexual relations on, on a kind of an ideal basis. 
But sexuality is a part of the human sankara. We wouldn't be here without it. But our relation, whatever sexual experiences you have, it's always here and now. And so, who is aware of sexuality? You know, there's, in, in your own body, you're aware of it. It's like this. When you're frightened, who's aware, what is aware of is, can, uh, can another sankara, can you create a fearless self that it, it can conquer fear and the satanic forces? And you may try, you know, try to be brave and fight it and resist it and, and uh, you may be able to conquer fears through just willpower and distraction. But with wisdom, we begin to see fear as a condition that arises according to other conditions. There's a lot to fear in life, is a physical form. These human forms are very delicate, you know, they're easily damaged. And so we live in a, in like in a city, or in a country like England, where we, we have a lot of laws, regulations, you know, so we've called it democracy. And uh, so the ideals of the past have manifested into institutions that create laws of democratic political systems. And then we feel, you know, if we're off in, the, in a jungle all by ourselves, you don't know what's going to happen. Because in the jungle, there's no law. The law of the jungle is survival of the fittest. So we congregate in villages, in communities, to feel safe because we, we were aware of how dangerous life is as a human form. Because life in the, on this planet, the animal life, is all about survival, and uh, it's about you know one species eating another. So we think you know when you look at nature, it's pretty harsh, and and um, we can idolize animals, but they've got to survive. And I remember. A cat one time was walking Jongrom out in the field here at Amravati. And uh, on a Jongrom path, and the cat came and caught a bird right in front of me as I was walking Jongrom, walking in meditation right. And it was the Amravati cat, pet cat which we tried to, we hope, would keep precepts. But, <laughs> but they don't have precepts. They're operating from nature, from the natural survival mechanisms that, that, that they inherit through being born in, a different, in different species. So the human species, we have a lot in common with the animals, because the body is an animal body. But we also have this reflective gift of being aware here and now, it's like this.
So being aware is being aware of both the pleasant and the unpleasant. And the pleasant we like to identify with happiness, contentment, unselfish attitudes, loving kindness, <clears throat> compassion, generosity, these kind of tendencies that we experience through these forms are what we'd like to identify with. And then we also have fear and we get angry, we get enraged, we get jealous, we can commit murder, we can be cruel and mean and nasty. And for many of us who want to identify with goodness, you know, we don't, we're frightened of that dark side when it manifests, when we, when we are angry or frightened or jealous, we want to, we can be frightened by that, by the dark forces, the evil forces, the satanic forces that we might be experiencing in the here and now. Emotionally, we're, it's scary, frightening. But it's still, there's sankaras to be understood as they arise and cease. And they're not what one is. You're not greed, you're not anger, hatred, or delusion. You know, we, this, this taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha is a kind of affirmation of our true nature. Conscious awareness here and now, deathless Dhamma. That's our true nature. And once we begin to realize that, then there's nothing to fear. We can deal with the vicissitudes that we experience as they change, with, with loss of loved ones, with old age, sickness, with, with the problems of the society. Because there's wisdom in the here and now, it's not just idealism. Wisdom is not about what's perfect and right and perfectly pure, but it's about here and now, seeing things as they are. And then we have this, the pace and Quranicha, all conditions are impermanent. That's wisdom. Not just being able to memorize that and chant it or uh, repeat, translated into English from Pali. But we began to investigate it. So like Vipassana, the four foundations of mindfulness, Vipassana meditation is about investigating. Is there anything permanent in the here and now? And as we witness, just through sitting quietly in a, in a meditation hall, we begin to, we, we can observe how the mind will fluctuate. One thought will create another thought. And then we try to not think. We, get, uh, we can be upset by our thinking habits. Uh, and uh, because we, we'd like to be silent here and now, but we, the obsessive thinking habits tend to take over and we, we don't want them, so we resist the obsessive thinking. But this is where patient awareness is necessary, to be patient. In meditation, you sit for so many for like an hour, and what happens? It can, it's not going to be the same every day because the conditions are different. 
So you, you know, when you're caught in emotional stress or anger, or resentment, and then when you sit in the meditation hall, then you try to resist these feelings, these emotions, trying to fight against them. But fighting against sankharas, desire to destroy sankharas, is another sankhara. You know, so you can't win the battle. You might be able to, through just stubborn willpower, conquer for a while, but it comes bouncing back again. So patient endurance, being able to, to just watch, be the putol, the knower of the world, the way the world is, and the world is impermanent and unsatisfactory. And to try to want the world to be permanent and satisfactory is, is out of ignorance. Not understanding the world, we want the world to, to become permanent, permanent good government, fairness, justice, equality, freedom, how everything should be. But investigating the world, knowing the world as the world, it is like this, it changes. And thoughts change, emotions change, feelings change, conditions change, body is changing. And what is aware of change is sati sampachanya, mindfulness. Dhamma vichaya, factor of enlightenment, is to investigate that, not just because the Buddha said everything is impermanent to believe it. You know, that's then you're caught in just believing what you read or what you hear. But investigating, Dhamma vichaya, is to investigate, to examine. And can a, can a sankhara examine another sankhara? I used to ask myself that question a lot. You know, if I'm a sankhara and everything is a sankhara, how can I can form opinions about experience as a sankhara? You know, I can have views about what's right or wrong, good or bad, true or false. But that's not investigating, that's just labeling something, the, the, the quality of some condition that will eventually cease. But what doesn't cease? The amatta dhamma, the deathless reality of here and now. So that is your true nature. Trust in that. Uh, and then, you know, to, to remind yourself when you're in, on meditation retreats or when you're in daily life, whatever state you happen to be in, whoever you're with, whatever the conditions might be, you are that which is aware of it. And that's how wisdom informs us. Through wisdom, then, the sankharas are no longer a problem. We have to live with them. But we're no longer identifying with them, being caught in the power of our delusions and what our desires might be or what we want to be, how we we want to have a, a sangha here at Amaravati that's in perfect harmony. That's the ideal. Where everybody's meditating and serious and keeping the Vinaya precepts and the ideal sangha. So 
So that's a imagined sangha. Sangha is an ideal. But just a physical sangha, bhikkhu sangha, a siladara sangha can't be perfect. Because it's, you know, when we try to to make something that's impermanent and a sankara in itself, we want perfection from it, we're going to be disillusioned. So we observe what we experience. And Ajahn Chah was in the Thai forest tradition, Northeast Thailand, they, they, you know, this Puto mantra, or Puru in Thai, you know, the one who knowing, the knowledge here and now is like this. That's what Puto means, what Buddha means, here and now. So taking refuge in Buddha is taking refuge in the here and now, not in some kind of imagined Buddha. Or a bygone Buddha, but Bhutang Sarnangachami, right now, refuge in awareness, here and now. So when you really trust in awareness, then you can deal with the aging process of your body or the frustrations and problems of a sangha life or society or family life. You know, we're not caught in the desire for it to be different, but we can be aware. This, like Amravati can only be like this. And some monks go through life always looking for the perfect monastery, a perfect silent place where they, they won't be challenged or frustrated by other people. So you can become a, a rishi, a hermit, But still, hermits have to deal with, with you know, that can be, there's a lot of frustration in hermetic life and just living all by yourself alone. Because that's the nature of samsara. It's frustrating, its very nature is, is like this. It's never going to be perfect. Perfection doesn't lie in changing conditions. Permanent perfection, but Dhamma is, we take refuge in Dhamma, in Buddha Dhamma, Sangha. So a Sangha then, one who, who knows this, one who takes refuge in Buddha and Dhamma, in awareness here and now. So the conventional sangha, like the bhikkhu sangha, is a convention. Siladhara sangha is a convention. So when we cling to the conventions, you know, we suffer from them. We suffer because monastic life can be a lot of misery if we cling to it. So the gate to the deathless is open. Aparuta de sangha matasa tawara. The gate to the deathless is open. Ye soda one taba moonjan tu satang, those who listen, trust in this. This the deathless is here and now, consciousness here and now. 
And you don't have to find out what you are as a sankara, because you're not any of the sankaras you believe you are, you think you are, you've been told that you are. They are empty phenomena, beginning and ending, being born, dying. Sape tama anatta holdama is anatta, it's not personal. So awareness here and now is not something I create as a person. I didn't create it. It's not a, something that has a beginning and ending. So we call it the deathless reality, amata dhamma. And that's consciousness here and now, which you're experiencing at this very moment, and it was by listening to what I'm saying. So a matadama doesn't have language, doesn't have views or opinions. It's where everything ceases, where all sankharas cease. And as you remind yourself of this, as we get caught up into our ha daily life habits and communal situations, family situations, we, we easily forget it. We easily go back into taking personal views, attitudes, and reactions to life. But the thing with the, the tradition, the convention that we we've taken on the Sangha life, the conventional Sangha life, is that the whole point of it is to encourage this kind of reflection in your daily life here at Amravati. Till it really sinks in. You know, and it's easy to understand the concepts, the words, You know, we have the intelligence to, to understand the scriptures, the suttas, in the Tripitaka. And there's all kinds of books published on meditation now and on Buddhism. Everything's available on the conventional level. But scriptures are conventions. You know, so they can only take us so far. They can, you know, we can become interested or we can have faith in the scriptures. But the suttas very much are, are not doctrinal positions that we take as Buddhists, but pointers to always the here and now. You read the different suttas, and it's always about here and now. Different ways of pointing, they're directional signs. They're not doctrines of what you should believe in. So I'd like to, to, in this opportunity I have to give these reflections, I always try to encourage you to trust. Yea, so the one thought, those who listening, trust in awareness, with awareness of the here and now. And trust is not just believing. It's not about believing what I'm saying or disbelieving. If you believe it, it's like this, or you, you think it's all rubbish, it's like this. 
But trust is, is necessary for practice until you realize, when budgetang, you realize this for yourself. So the directional signs are very helpful, but you don't cling to directional signs. You know, there's no point in clinging to the signs where the, the answer is monastery, where the kitchen is, points to there's all kinds of signs in this monastery that give you direction of where to go for meetings or meditation or kitchen. And we don't cling to the signs. We observe them and then we go in that direction. So the suttas are directional signs. They're not to be cling, clung to, but to go in the direction they're pointing at, which is always here. It's always whatever state you're in, wherever place you're in, it's all, you're always here as a, as a physical being. And the time is always now. So I offer this as a reflection for this afternoon.